Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, sharing data about genomic variants, a clinical and scientific imperative, presented by Robert Cook Deegan. He is a professor for the future of innovation in society and consortium for science, policy, and outcomes at Arizona State University. I am Marjorie Torres of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Cook Deegan. I will now turn the presentation over to him. So I guess we're ready to get started. And um, let me start this uh, presentation by just setting the context and, and give you an idea of where we're going to go. Um, I'm going to start by explaining some cases, just exemplifying some cases of why uh, the interpretation of genomic variants is important, why it matters in clinical care, and why the need for data sharing has become so much more apparent in recent years. And we'll progress for some, from those specific cases to some of the background on policy and um, issues that have come up in dealing with this cluster of issues uh, over the past several years, and then we'll progress through a specific case where uh, we're trying to deal with the issue of data sharing about genomic variants, uh, specifically focusing on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes that have been tested for over two decades on millions of people worldwide. And I'll finish with some ideas about what we can do to improve the situation. So the reason that genomic variants uh, and data sharing are seen as being kind of, they grow up together, uh, comes from the convergence of two technologies. One is the ability to characterize DNA, particularly DNA sequencing, but also hybridization methods and, and polymerase chain reaction and all sorts of other ways of analyzing DNA have converged with another miraculous technology, that is computing technologies, and in recent years, cloud technologies, to create a lot of data and the ability to um, sequence a genome, which seemed to be uh, a fantasy when the idea of the Human Genome Project was proposed in 1985, has become something that we can do in a matter of hours um, and for less than $1,000 in 2018. So we're generating reams of data, and those data are being shared on lots of people about lots of diseases, and we're following people over time and trying to link the data to what happens to those people. Do they get sick? What have they been exposed to? Uh, what images do we have of their brains and their bodies? Can we see tumors in their bodies? Do we, can we correlate what's going on in the genome with what's going on in that person's body? So lots of data, lots of genes, lots of people, and lots of linkages among databases. So what does this matter for clinical care? And the way I wanted to illustrate that is to, to use two cases. One is uh, related to the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Just think of a woman who um, lives in the United States, is being tested in the United States by a lab here, but her one parent is from Mexico and the other parent is from Nigeria. And she's tested and found to have a variant in the BRCA gene. That is something that is not the common sequence in a particular position that's related to exon 11 of the BRCA1 gene. 
and she has two people in her family who have developed cancer younger than average. And therefore, you as a clinician might be thinking, oh gosh, maybe this is somebody who's at special risk. And now we've got a variant that we don't actually don't know how to interpret. Now, why don't we know how to interpret it? Well, because most of the testing for BRCA1 and 2 has been done in European and North American populations by labs that are connected to uh, robust and well-funded health systems. But a lot of the populations around the globe have not been tested. And for these particular two genes, it's quite common for different mutations to be more common in different populations. So the three mutations that most people are familiar with in Ashkenazi Jewish populations that account for well over 90% of the risk in those populations, it's not the same mutation that you would find most commonly in China or Nigeria or Mexico or Iceland. So we're even 20 years, more than two decades into common genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2, we're still coming upon new variants that we don't know how to interpret, particularly for populations that are outside of um, the, the North American and European continents. So that's one example. Another example is a child um, who died at age two in status epilepticus. Um, and this is a case where a mutation had been detected in a sodium channel um, in, in the gene that encodes a, a voltage-gated sodium channel in interneurons. Um, and it was declared by the lab to be uh, a variant of unknown significance Although this particular variant had been reported in a child from Canada uh, who had severe epilepsy of infancy. And the reason this matters is that the treatment for sodium channel uh, caused epilepsy is pretty much the opposite of treatment for other kinds, the most common kinds of uh, epilepsy. And in fact, the standard epileptic drugs make this syndrome called Dravet's syndrome they actually make it worse. Um, and this child had a mutation that was detected, had been reported in two publications in the literature, and was actually a uh, subject of a patent that said, yes, it's one of those mutations that causes this disease, but it, it was reported at the time by the laboratory as not um, pathogenic, and in fact, not. we don't quite know how to interpret it. Um, I raise this because uh, now, it's more than a decade later, his case is still not in the medical literature where other people can use that information to make clinical inferences. So this is, these are two case examples of why the sharing of data about genomic variants is really important, um, not only for advancing science, but also in very practical decision making in the clinic. These are not new problems. Um, there are many statements about the need to share data. Um, in the case of science, in order to prove that what you've said is true, you need to share your information. Um, and in the case of clinical uh, inference, this is the whole idea of evidence-based medicine. These three reports, uh, the 2002, 2011, and 2012 reports from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, all state these principles, and basically they say that we need access to the data, and we also need access to enough information about how the data were interpreted to be able to verify the claims that are being made about the data. This is layered on top of a movement that I think is where policy will eventually rest, but actually has not been incorporated into the way we do business these days. And that is that information about you has to be accessible to you. Um, a right to access your information and also a right to send the information about you to anyone that you want to. Um, so uh, the idea here is your genome belongs to you. This is something that's a norm, but it's not established in practice. Now, this is just one example of many, many examples of the need for collective action. That is, no one institution is ever going to be able to interpret all these variants for all the genes in all the people for all the conditions that we care about. 
in uh, the early 1960s, uh, Garrett Hardin wrote this very famous uh, essay called The Tragedy of the Commons, in which he said, well, you know, when we're confronted with these problems of collective action, and when we've got something that is valuable to all of us, we can confront a tragedy, which is everybody's going to either overuse it, or in the case of data, if people put their fingers on it and use it as a proprietary asset, we've got a problem because a common resource is going to be underused. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, pictured here in this slide, was an economist who got the, well, actually, she was in everything. She was more than an economist. She was a sociologist and a political scientist. And she got the Nobel Prize in economics for her work that said, you know, Garrett Hardin said there are only two solutions to that problem. One is the government steps in and tries to fix things by, by regulating it. And the other is let the market decide. And in the case of a commons, you actually, it's by definition the sort of thing that a market is not going to solve. And what she pointed out was actually we come across these problems all, all the time. And it turns out that when people talk to each other, we can come up with rules and ways of doing business that enable us to make sense of the world. And actually those things are called commons and we can make them work. And she came up with a set of rules that tend to work and they depend on people and institutions developing the rules and being able to enforce those rules by defining a community and coming up with the process of both crafting the rules and doing something about them. In the concept of genomics, one of the salient features of the Human Genome Project is that it was set as a, an open science initiative. What you're looking at here is the original statement. This is John Sulston's handwriting. Uh, John just died a couple weeks ago uh, at age 75 of stomach cancer. But in 1996, he wrote this on the board at, uh, at a hotel in Bermuda. Um, and these became known as the Bermuda Principles for Data Sharing. This was for the high throughput sequencing centers that were participating in the Human Genome Project. And the rule was, if you're generating sequence data, you have to post it on the internet uh, within 24 hours. And the whole idea was, let's make this information available to everybody, and the labs that are getting all this money to do this high-tech whiz-bang science aren't the only people that get access to the data. So this is a precedent for open science, but it doesn't really it doesn't really apply to data that involves human beings and clinical information so the bermuda principles while they work for pure science and for data like dna sequence data coming from a few centers they've had to be modified um, as we've turned to uh, sources of data that involve identifiable human beings in a clinical context um, these Bermuda principles have been modified for other organisms, and they've been Im embedded in policies like the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH um, in the policies that were first stated in 2003 and then reiterated in 2014. And on this slide, we see a bunch of other examples of policies that have emerged over the years. But the problem is that the data that we're dealing with these days are much more geographically dispersed. they are different kinds of data. There are many more linkages among the different kinds of databases. And the world of biotechnology and medicine has gotten a whole lot more complicated since the Bermuda pr principles were enunciated in 1996. So some examples of things that can make this more difficult. Um, one is the number of players. When this agreement was reached in Bermuda, there were only five countries involved in the Human Genome Project, and then China joined in 1996. Um, and you could get representatives from all the major labs into one room of less than 50 people. Um, as one example of kind of the similar trying to form a commons effort in the current context in genomics, the Global Alliance has more than 70 countries, more than 400 organizations, and more than 800 people. And that's a whole lot more complicated thing to deal with. Um, another feature, of course, is it's not just DNA sequence. We're also talking about electronic health records, genealogic data, 
what people have been exposed to, where they live, how old they are, um, what country they come from, where they live now, and other information. We may even have data about their pulse rate or stuff that's coming in from them about their exercise and activity through uh, smartwatches and other sources of information. So um, it's more complicated. The data are much more diverse. And we're not going to be able to have a single rule like the share your data every 24 hours. Um, the, even in the case of the Bermuda Principles, it turns out that it was kind of complicated to get agreement on sharing the information. And it wasn't clear exactly what information should be included. So let's take DNA sequence as an example. Even just thinking about G DNA sequence variants, there are many layers to the data. One is the raw sequence reads that come off of the machines that are doing the sequencing. The next layer is, so you take all the snippets of information from um, individual reads and you assemble those into a sequence. And then you take that assembled sequence and you compare it to the reference genome to identify variants. And then once you've identified the variants, you have to say, do these variants mean anything? What do we know about them? Which ones are associated with disease? So even at the level of DNA sequence and figuring out what that means, we've got four layers of technical um, uh, standards and interpretations that need to be imposed on the data to be able to make a clinical inference. And that's without thinking about the correlations to who gets cancer, who doesn't get cancer, whether they're being followed over time, what images we have of their brains and bodies, um, and things like that. So um, this information commons has gotten a whole lot more complicated, and it's not just about DNA sequence. It's also about proteins, cells, whole organisms, and the environment in which we live. So some of the challenges that come into being when you start dealing with data, data about people is that you have to deal with the fact that the information is coming from people under usually under the context of informed consent. And moreover, governments all over the world have discovered, hey, you know what? The data about people, especially medical information, might be really valuable, and that's related to biotechnology. And countries in the South and in the developing world don't completely trust the countries in North America and Europe and uh, rich countries and would like to preserve some of the value from the information that they're creating. And they are passing laws to, that restrict the free flow of samples and information across national borders for very understandable reasons. Um, so information and samples actually have a layer of law in many, many countries, India, Russia, uh, China, all have laws saying you cannot export data without giving, getting permission for doing so. Um, moreover, even without the national laws, these are data about human beings. And in fact, some of these data are incredibly private. Um, variants in the BRCA1 and 2 gene are not the sort of thing that you want your children to be asked about in their junior high class because somebody's gone on the internet and said, hey, Judy, do you have a, a variant in, in your BRCA gene? I see that your mom does. Um, so these are highly private information. Uh, th th this is very private information, and it needs to be subjected to uh, review and control, and people are not going to share their information unless they feel like it's safe and it's being used in a responsible matter, manner. So these are all issues of data flow that don't really come up when you're talking about raw DNA sequence um, from a, a, a reference population. So what are the policy issues that come up? Um, we did a, an analysis of uh, the clinical integration of next generation sequencing into clinical genomics. Um, we did this as a, as a Delphi process where you go to experts and you say, what do you think of the problems and what can we do about those problems? And we bundled problems into 19 categories. Um, those were things like reimbursement of genetic tests, the FDA regulation of genetic tests, 
um, coverage and reimbursement decisions, um, and issues like that, intellectual property, gene patents. Um, and among those 19 categories, we had one that was data sharing. And the data sharing came out as being tied for number one with reimbursement as being really important. And it was dead last in people's estimation of whether we were going to be able to do anything about it. So why is that? Well, it's because this all uh, our survey was going on at the time around uh, when the Supreme Court of the United States invalidated the BRCA one and two patents. And it became readily apparent at that point that data about genomic variants in BRCA1 and BRCA2 were not being shared. The most conspicuous case was, of course, the proprietary database that was held by Myriad Genetics as part of its genetic testing service in Salt Lake City. Um, but it's not just Myriad Genetics. It's also other laboratories. And it's, in fact, National Health Services and, and laboratories and databases all over the world. We don't actually have a system of sharing information about genomic variants even though the clinical interpretation, going back to our original case study, it's quite clear that over time the world is going to be a better place if we can share information about the clinical information, what, what we know about the clinical implications of genomic variants. But one of the one of the flies in the ointment is that we don't have strong incentives for sharing the information. And in fact, if you've got a big proprietary database, which Myriad had based on almost 2 million tests that they had done mainly on um, uh, Europeans and North Americans, um, why would they share that? It's in their interest to keep that as a proprietary database. But if all of the laboratories do that, then we're never going to be able to do the kind of global collective interpretation that we need to be able to do. So this is the policy dilemma that uh, face, faces us right now. And that's why the idea of genomic data sharing was seen as one of the hardest problems to solve. Um, and as I've alluded to, the commercial incentives are actually a big part of, uh, uh, of the issue that we're facing these days because there are many, many more companies out there doing many, many more kinds of things than there were in 1996 when the Bermuda Principles were enunciated. Uh, there are labs that do interpretation. There are labs that do genetic testing and hand off the interpretation. There are labs that um, are doing clinical testing, ancestry testing, and some labs are specializing in prenatal uh, uh, testing of serum-based or plasma-based uh, DNA. Others are only doing genomic testing. So there are lots of different kinds of labs out there, and there are also different kinds of databases all over the world, and lots of people trying to make sense of this information under very different business models. So turning now again to the BRCA1 and 2, What's the state of affairs now? The data I'm showing here on the, the, the Venn diagram is the state of affairs that at the beginning of 2015, where if you looked at the top five sources of data about the variants in these two very important genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, what you notice is the biggest lobes in these Venn diagrams, in the ClinVar and BRCA lobes, uh, B BRCA share lobes, it turns out that of all the variants that had been discovered and put into public databases by 2015, the largest number of them are only in one of those five sources of information that's available publicly around the globe. Now, the very common variants are the ones that are dead center in there that are in all of these databases. For example, the three founder mutations among the Ashkenazi Jewish populations that account for most of the risk in those populations. So the com variants are in all the databases. But the fact is, we're discovering many, many variants still to this day after millions of tests have been done worldwide. And we have more than 19,000 variants in the public databases and Myriad says it has about 20,000 in its database. Uh, we don't know whether there's how much overlap there is because we don't have access to the Myriad databases. 
Moreover, we estimate that at least 40,000 more single nucleotide polymorphisms will be discovered in these uh, two genes because they're very big genes. Um, and moreover, if you include insertions and deletions and rearrangements, there's an infinite number of vari variants that, are, that, that could become apparent in these two genes. So we're going to have a lot more mutations discovered, and we're going to discover most of those new mutations when we do testing in populations in Africa, in Latin America, in South Asia, in parts of the world where testing has not been common, and in the populations even within the United States like Native American populations, Medicaid populations, and low-income populations that have not been tested uh, up to date. So just to give you an example, a report that came out from China just last year found that when they did sequencing of these two genes in people with breast cancer, more than 40% of the variants that they discovered in BRCA1 and 2 were not reported in the uh, public database that they used for comparison, the Breast Cancer Information Core at NIH. What that tells us is as we go into new populations, we'll be finding different variants that are important to those populations. Where are we now for these two genes? Well, we know that more than 3,700 of the variants are associated with disease. But we're also discovering that we don't have firm information about how strongly those associations, how, how strong those associations are, and sometimes we make mistakes in both directions. Most of the variants of unknown significance are actually going to turn out to not be disease-causing. We know that because as we go into populations, we will discover that there are lots of people walking around with variants that don't ever get breast or ovarian cancer or other things that are associated with these two genes. But we have to go through this process of beginning to understand which variants are disease associated and which aren't. And it's only gonna work if we do that by testing all over the world. So what's beginning to imagine is the formation of a commons for sharing data. It's beginning to nucleate around the BRCA1 and 2 genes in part because of several shared characteristics that are really unusual. One is, as I mentioned, in 2013, the Supreme Court invalidated the U.S. patents on uh, BRCA1 and 2 genes. What that meant is new laboratories, within hours of when the Supreme Court announced this decision, laboratories began to offer tests other than myriad genetics. Well, there are a lot of those labs. You can get tests for BRCA at more than a dozen laboratories in the United States and dozens more around the world. And all of those laboratories have a strong incentive to be able to make good, sound clinical inferences on the BRCA mutations. And it, that is going to require pooling of all the testing that's going on all over the world getting those into common public databases where the clinical inferences can be creditably and verifiably interpreted, and then turn that into a clinical resource. Um, so that's beginning to happen genome-wide by the formation of uh, databases such as the ClinVar database that is run by the National Library of Medicine. Um, but the flow of information into ClinVar um, is kind of uh, bumpy, and it's not complete, and it's not completely global. So in the case of BRCA1 and 2, a community has begun to form. Um, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health was formed in 2013, and one of its flagship pro uh, projects from the very beginning was something called BRCA Challenge, which was precisely about getting global data sharing to begin to happen. Um, the BRCA Challenge has created a resource called the BRCA Exchange. Um, it's basically a link to all these databases to keep track of what do we know about the variants that, that have been discovered and reported into these various databases. And it's linked to an expert interpretation framework, a consortium of experts from all over the world called Enigma, and another consortium that's looking at the things that influence the, the severity of uh, 
and, and the timing of variants in these two genes, BRCA1 and 2. Um, so all sorts of consortia have begun to coalesce to try to create a commons. Um, and because of the former monopoly, everybody has an incentive to share their data to catch up to the proprietary databases that already exist. So um, this is underway, um, and it's very clear that the process of interpreting variants for BRCA1 and 2 is far ahead of what it is for most other genes that haven't been tested for two decades. And we're going to have to go through this process of narrowing down the number of variants that we don't know how to interpret over time. So that's kind of the policy process that we're faced with. Um, so how are we going to do that interpretation? Well, as we think about incorporating this into people's lives, we've got a lot of issues that are going to come to the surface. One is we've all come to an agreement that, in fact, before you get a genetic test, you better know what you're getting into. So we have to have a framework for doing genetic test counseling uh, pre and post, and especially for people who get a positive result to help them interpret their result. Um, moreover, we need the different labs to have standards for how the data are reported, interpreted, and all these layers of um, interpretation that we talked about for um, the interpretation, even of something as simple as a single genomic variant, we have to have a system of standards and interpretive frameworks that people agree this is the best that we have these days. And we also need to have labs that are testing each other's interpretation and making sure that they get the same results. So we need a system that does that. We also need a system that says, when we change our interpretation of a variant, and this will happen, we will discover new information that says what we used to think was disease associated is not always disease associated, or it's only disease associated in certain families or in certain environmental conditions. We need to get that information back to the people who have already been tested and also get that reclassification information into the system. And we need to know the standards for when do you do that? How, what's the level of evidence that you need before you go back to people and say, hey, we changed how we're interpreting the variant that you have in your body? So these are all policy questions that are being ad addressed in real time, and the BRCA1 and 2 genes are among the places where that's going to be taking place. Here are some of the uh, organizations that are involved in trying to orchestrate that. I've alluded to all of them. Uh, earlier in the talk, except that I don't think I mentioned the um, the, the uh, Belgian database, Lovid, that has been involved in this space for quite some time, and the Human Variome Project, which is a, a global effort to share data about many genes, um, not just the BRCA1 and 2 genes. So the goals here are to share the data in such a way that science can advance and that people facing decisions about what, whether they want to have prophylactic mastectomies or salpingo oophorectomies, that is the removal of both breasts and both ovaries and fallopian tubes, um, in order to prevent the origin of cancer in those people who are at very high risk, um, those are pretty high stakes decisions to be made, and we want to be making those with the very best information available. Those, that's the goal of the BRCA challenge. And the idea of the BRCA challenge was first to create this data resource, which is the BRCA exchange, which has been in existence for about a year and a half. And um, it has, as I've mentioned before, has 19,000 variants in it. And it has, it's linked to the Enigma Consortium that is the formal way of trying to interpret the clinical significance of these variants. And it is now trying to build the interfaces to connect to patients and to non-specialist physicians as more and more people are getting access to genetic testing as it becomes much more widespread and less expensive. So what can we do to improve the disclosure of information and the flow of data? We don't have standards for any of the things that I'm talking about here. Um, but there are some things that we can do, and some people have begun to do some of these things. Um, it could be that payers will decide, as Aetna has, 
that they will only pay for tests when the labs that are creating the tests agree that they're going to share data with public databases where the findings can be verified. Um, so one payer has made that decision. Um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services has not. And uh, most, most health programs around the world have not made that policy decision, but they could. The accreditation of laboratories and the, the certification of individual lab directors, pathologists, oncologists, and other users of the data could also be made contingent on agreeing that if you're making clinical decisions, you're gonna do it in an evidence-based framework. And that evidence-based framework requires the sharing of data uh, into public databases. Um, we already have standards that you don't get to publish something unless you present enough data and enough information that others can reach the same conclusion. But unfortunately, while that is a standard, it is not one that is widely and universally adopted. Um, so we need to enforce that standard. Um, and finally, the Food and Drug Administration has been talking about uh, regulating the uh, laboratory de developed tests uh, that are most relevant for the kinds of tests that are taking place in the genomic space. Um, there's been a kind of a start and stop process where FDA has been trying to think about it. Um, in, um, in 2016, the Food and Drug Administration released a white paper about the prospect of possibly certifying or at least listing and saying these are databases that are that we trust to make clinical inferences based on genomic uh, information um, that's they're trying to stay ahead of the curve at the food and drug administration and at the european medicines agency and other places around the world that are facing these issues um, but we don't have those standards in place and this is a, a place to stay tuned for what the policies are going to be um, and finally, us, those of us who are health professionals or genetic counselors or even just people who care about this stuff, um, have ethical norms and standards. And the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics has standards that implicitly imply that you should be sharing data if you're making clinical inferences or trying to advance science. And the AMA passed two years ago, passed a statement of ethics that said, if you're playing in this space, sharing data is one of your ethical obligations. So we have many policy levels ranging from normative, that is ethical obligations, to things that would matter in terms of money and certification and the ability to do our work. Um, so it's, this is not a, a, a source of despair. Um, and going back to the idea that this was really important, but almost completely impossible to solve, I think uh, over the last two or three years, it's become more apparent that there actually are some things that we can do and that a commons could emerge from uh, current practices. So uh, I'll, I'll finish by pointing out the fact that that we, uh, I, I'm, this slide is about a grant that has been given to Baylor College of Medicine led by Amy McGuire there, a lawyer bioethicist. Um, we've been studying for the past three years, how do we build a medical information commons? And our case study of BRCA one and two um, is just an example of trying to build a medical information commons. And to generalize this issue, um, it's quite apparent that the similar issues are gonna come up with imaging of uh, uh, MRI imaging or PET imaging or other kinds of imaging for, for medical information that comes through medical records, for claims data. We're gonna have the same kind of issue that emerges for data of many kinds, but I focused here on sharing data about genomic variants in part because we have this norm of open science that has been so productive and so amazing. And it is also one of the places where the technology is becoming cheaper, much more widely available, and the flow of data is going to be coming in much faster, and we need to learn how to deal with it. So with that,
I'll turn it over to our moderator and we'll turn to questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robert Kotegan, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, What, why do laboratories want to share their data? Why not keep them as a proprietary asset? So that's a really good question. Um, and there's no simple answer, um, in part for the following reasons. Um, right now, some labs actually do have an incentive to keep their data as a proprietary secret. Um, and that's because they have access to the public data and they also have uh, access to their own data. And when you're in that situation, especially if you've got a really big database that's that's uh, quite useful, you actually don't want to share those data. And for good, good business reasons, you're not going to share the data. Um, but the situation, for example, with BRCA, and actually this is going to be the situation for most other genes throughout the human genome. Um, in most cases, no one laboratory has enough data to do a really good job of interpreting all of the variants that they're coming across. And therefore, everyone has an incentive to make the process of identifying and interpreting the variants that we come across in a global sense much more reliable. And no one laboratory is going to have the resources to do it. But let's go to that situation that existed in the United States until 2013 when the Supreme Court invalidated the patents, um, because Myriad had done 2 million tests on people, um, mainly in Europe and North America, um, they had a very large database. And for the years from around 1998 until 2013, in the United States, they were the only laboratory that was doing BRCA testing on a large scale. Um, that actually didn't work in other parts of the world. And I think if we added up all the testing that was done in other laboratories all over the world, it would be more or less the same amount of data as Myriad has in its database. But Myriad had its own database, and it was keeping track of all that stuff. Um, and therefore, it has the largest individual database uh, on BRCA variants. The other labs, though, that entered that space in 2013 and began to legally offer genetic testing, um, they had a pretty strong incentive to share data because they aren't just doing DNA sequencing. They're doing DNA sequencing and saying, you have a variant, and we're going to help you interpret that variant. We're going to report to your doctor and to you what that variant means. Is it associated with disease or isn't it? And in that situation, all of the labs all over the world have a very strong incentive to share their data, get into public databases. Because what happens if they don't share their data is every single one of those laboratories has to build up its own database and its own algorithms for interpreting the data. And that's really expensive and it's hard. And if the system were working properly, what we would have is a set of public data resources that everyone can go to that contains the most reliable, the most current uh, data that we can find, and also can be used for whatever interpretive framework you want to apply to it. Um, but it becomes a common data pool for the whole world for making valid clinical inferences. And in even in the case of Myriad Genetics, eventually, the proprietary value of its, its own internal database will dissipate because there's just no way that Myriad's going to do all the testing for the whole world. Moreover, just to make the point that uh, came up during the presentation, Myriad, there are lots of populations where they don't have the data at all. And yet people are migrating all over the world these days and genetic testing is going on all over the world. And even somebody who's sending a sample to Myriad Genetics from some other country, um, they may come across a variant where Myriad doesn't know how to interpret it. And in the long run, the whole system is going to work a whole lot better if we manage to come up with a system 
that allows us to share data and put the common elements that we all care about collectively into a central resource and then allow all the businesses to compete on grounds other than access to the data. Thank you. Our next question is, what are the most valuable resources of data for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes after two decades of testing? So um, the most common variants in these two genes have already been discovered. In fact, they were the variants that allowed us to discover the, the, the BRCA1 and 2 genes in the first place. Those are families with, with uh, demonstrable inheritance of cancer risk. Um, and the most common of those are, of course, the ones you're going to stumble across first as you're looking at very big families that, that clearly have clusters of cancer. Um, what we're discovering now is more and more rare variants in these two genes. Um, so that process is going to go on for a very long time, even in populations that have been tested, because uh, we know that there are tens of thousands of variants still left to be found. Um, but the other thing that is really interesting about certain diseases, and it includes the cancers like, BR like breast and ovarian cancer associated with BRCA1 and 2, and some other diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, for example. These are diseases that have onset after reproductive age, and therefore there's not strong selective pressure that forces them, um, that, that means if you've inherited a mutation, you're less likely to have kids. And in that situation, it's much more likely that you're gonna have individual founder populations in different populations all over the world. So it turns out that the most common variants in Mexico or Iceland or Nigeria or China are not going to be the same as the three Ashkenazi Jewish population um, variants that are commonly associated with uh, breast and ovarian cancer and BRCA1 risk. So we're going to be discovering the most common variants in different populations all over the world. And what that means is the, the the data that are most valuable are the data in populations that haven't been tested yet. So that's number one. Number two is populations where there is a fairly common marriage among relatives, which means that uh, mutations, that is variants, are more likely to be inherited. So uh, why does that matter for the interpretation of variants? Well, it turns out that one of the rules for figuring out whether a variant is cancer associated is a kind of a heuristic, a rule of thumb, that two bad mutations in the same gene don't, uh, don't survive into uh, becoming a, a, a viable fetus. And so if you've got a variant that has been inherited that you don't know how to interpret, you say, here's a variant we don't know how to interpret, and you find that it's been inherited with a known disease-associated variant, it's less likely that that variant is disease associated, the one that you don't know how to interpret. Because if it were, then you wouldn't be seeing it in a living human being. So it's not a complete, you know, it's not a law of nature, but it's a heuristic that's quite powerful. And if you find that in lots of people, you can be pretty confident that that variant is not a disease causing variant. So testing in populations that haven't been tested, and particularly in populations that have consanguineous marriage, would be the most powerful sources of new information about BRCA1 and 2. Thank you. Our next question is, there are 20,000 genes, and each has many variants. How will we ever learn what they mean? Huh. Um, so, uh, I guess maybe the answer to that is never. We probably won't really. Um, but boy, there's a lot of stuff that we can do, especially if we develop a system. Um, and going back to this idea of a commons, part of the reason that, that folks are paying attention to the BRCA1 and 2 genes in particular is that it's not just that um, we've been testing for two decades. But in addition to that, 
These two genes are associated with breast and ovarian cancer, which is also linked to very active and activated um, groups of people who care about breast and ovarian cancer and are very effective at building policy and coming up with standards. And there's a lot of political energy and a lot of, 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 of political will to solve this problem. So there's a political aspect uh, to this. And moreover, if we build a system that works for these two genes, we should be able to build a system that works for other genes because a database actually doesn't care about what gene is in its, what gene you've got data on. Most of the informatics structures don't actually care about that. Um, so if we build the system to allow data to flow, um, it, it should allow us to do that. Um, and one of the other things that's distinctive about BRCA1 and 2 is when you get a genetic testing result, you can actually do something about it and you change clinical decisions. That's true for a lot of other genes, but because of that fact, there's been a real reason to, to the stakes are really high and therefore there's been a strong incentive to make sure that we're doing this right. Um, and what I'm hoping is that that will spill over to um, other disease conditions like, like the epilepsies, like the uh, cardiovascular diseases that are associated with uh, genetic risk. So that's kind of where we are. Um, it's absolutely true. These are probably two of the most thoroughly studied genes in the human genome, along with cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's disease and a few others. But uh, boy, most of those 20,000 genes, we don't know. And we do know that several hundred of those are probably gonna be associated with one uh, condition or another. So we do have a long way to go, but we also have a set of solutions that we might be able to apply um, if we get the system to work right for the ones that we're working on right now. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. Our next question is, what are the most promising policy changes that might encourage sharing of your data? So I think the single most powerful um, incentive for sharing data would be for payers to say, we will not pay for a genetic test unless that we can verify that the system is working and that that test has been done in such a way that it can be verified. So moving away from a trust us, just pay us for the result to a system where the labs are constantly making sure that they actually detect the variants they say they are detecting, and moreover, that the system of interpreting those variants is um, reliable. Um, and the reason that I think it's the payment for the genetic test that's the most powerful source of leverage is because most of the data, even now, for BRCA1 and 2 is flowing in not from research labs. So the journal and the publication standards and things like that, they're important, but they won't get us where we need to go. And usually the conditions of payment are really, really important in driving the system um, because at the end of the day, money talks and drives policy. So if we could get a norm that payers say, we don't pay you unless you play by the rules, and we come up with a set of rules that create a robust commons that enables us to make the best uh, interpre interpretations of genomic variants that we can, um, then I think we've solved a pretty big problem. And uh, I turn to those payers like uh, the Centers for Medicaid, uh, Medicaid and Medicare Services and the private payers in the United States and the national health systems in France, in Germany, in Switzerland, in Australia, and Canada. If those players all agreed that you need to set up a verifiable and independent uh, system that includes data sharing as a criterion, I think we've got the problem 90% solved. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Robert Cook Deegan for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabReads for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available.
for on-demand viewing through July of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinths letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>